Michael Hernandez here, MLH episode one of Uncensored MLH. And man, I'm just super excited to get to talk to this next guest, Dimitri Gorgidas over there out of the, I, I would say East Bay, man, San Ramon, California, but you say San Francisco now, right? Yeah, I mean, I always say San Francisco just because it's kind of, I, I feel like I like to represent the whole San Francisco on the grander scale of things, you know what I mean? Like the whole North NorCal to me. Uh, I like to represent, you know, I kind of growing up here, I moved from Chicago in like sixth grade. So I kind of grew up kind of, you know, going through the city, going to Oakland, Berkeley, you know, I didn't really spend a lot of time out here. So I, I feel like when I go out and I want to fight, I want to represent the whole, whole Bay Area, you know what I'm saying? Not just, you know, just uh, this little part of the Tri-Valley, you know what I mean? Yeah. And can you talk about that? I feel moving at that age is such a pivotal time because you're barely starting to learn, you know, social skills. You're barely getting into probably kindergarten, first grade. Can you talk about that move to the Bay Area? Because it's probably one of the most diverse areas in the world. And you're going over there from Chicago, another pretty diverse area. How was the move for you and how has it been just acclimating to San Francisco growing up? Honestly, at the time, it was one of the hardest moves just because, you know, you leave all your friends, you know, you leave all the connections you kind of have you know, back there, and then coming here where you don't know anybody, you know, especially being at, like, what, a 10 years old, 11 years old, it definitely was a uh, a hard thing to cope with at the time, you know, it, it fucked with my uh, my mental health, you know, mess with my, uh, my, my, my childhood kind of growing up, but in the grand scheme of things, it was, like, the best thing for me, because, one, it is diverse there, but at the same time, not the most diverse. Um, it's a Midwest, you know what I mean? There's a, there's a specific type of people that live there. And if you're not that type of person, you don't really fit in there too much. So even though I had friends there, I didn't really ever feel at home there. And, and looking back at the Bay Area now, like the connections that I have here, like the way I am, the way the Bay is, it's so much more my home than that ever was. So that and as well as, you know, kind of growing up with that struggle of like, having to find new people, kind of having to find my roots, I think actually helped me figure out at a young age, like who I was and what I wanted to do. You know, I knew from a young age I wanted to fight, but it's because you move, you don't have much friends. So you kind of got to figure out like, all right, well, who am I? And you know, who, who do I want to be when I, now in this new state where no one really knows me? So many gyms over there in the Bay Area. How did you decide to come upon Chris from BJJ? And I, you have done, I mean, wonders over there now, brown belt in jiu-jitsu. You're now yeah. one and up in your professional MMA career. And that didn't come, though, without some trial and error. You went two and two in the amateur career, showed that, right. you know, you wanted to show, I feel, a diversity in your game. You really went out there and just let it all hang loose. Can you talk about that mixed martial arts career developing over there at Chris from BJJ? And just overall being in the Bay Area, because I feel... I talked about it with Gilbert Melendez before he did that uh, show over there at Texas U Arena, but it's slowly becoming one of the hubs of mixed martial arts once again. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's funny. So when actually I first moved here, I started doing Muay Thai at a gym called uh, Harding. I think it was just called Harding Taekwondo. And then it was in San Ramon. And then uh, John Santos, who, who runs Team Santos, when he kind of first started running his team, he actually was out, out of there. Um, I remember Dan Black, when he first started uh, training with, like, Xavier Vigny and some of those guys. At one point, he was coming over there, and he kind of coached us a little bit. So it was actually super cool kind of seeing, like, the OGs in the game there. And then eventually, um, I kind of just realized at a young age, like, my parents wouldn't let me fight when I was young. They wouldn't let me do smokers. They wouldn't let me do any amateurs. So I just kind of stuck to wrestling because I knew I didn't really need their approval. I could kind of just do it through the school. And then... I went to ASU, came back, and I actually had kind of given up on my dream of fighting. Like, I just couldn't find a gym where I felt like a coach cared enough about me that they weren't just kind of – I wasn't wasting my time. You know what I mean? And so I was actually working at a sandwich shop, and Crispin came What's in. What sandwich shop? Damn, bro. Jimmy John's. Jimmy John's. Jimmy John's. Hey, freaky fast delivery and freaky fast kicks, freaky fast hands, man. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. That's what I'm saying. That was I was the first. That was the first time me being freaky fast. But you know, he came in there and he was like, "Hey, man, you hella big. You ever thought about fighting?" And I was like, "Dude, that's all I've ever wanted to do." And he was like, "Let's come to my gym." So I came to his gym and you know he gave me a chance, put me on his fight team, and I mean he really did take a chance on me. And then. Shortly, like, after I started training there, he was like, you know, man, what do you, what exactly do you want to do, like, besides fighting? And I thought, I was like, you know, I want to fight, you know, maybe one day have my own fighters, you know, have my own gym and stuff. And he, he brought me on, he offered me a job there, you know, 
told me he would show me the ropes, told me how to, he told me how to teach classes and I mean, the rest have been history. So honestly, I owe it all to him because if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have gone back into fighting. You know, I wouldn't be teaching right now. I wouldn't have gotten where I am. But he did definitely put a lot of time on me because, I mean, during the pandemic, I mean, we weren't allowed to train, but there were so many times that it was like, you know, he would call me up and it would be me, him and like Jeremiah, you know, and it was just like, all right. Uh, I'm the body there, but he would just bring me along just so I could learn stuff, just so I could kind of be there, just so I could kind of absorb, you know, all the information and stuff. And so that helped my growth exponentially, you know, just kind of being around these two, you know, Chris Beam's a fifth degree black belt now, sixth degree, Jeremy's a, a third degree. And being able to be around them and kind of just absorb all that game and all that knowledge and, you know, especially early on in my, like, training was was huge and and that definitely kind of gave me the confidence when i when i did start fighting to kind of go out there and just test different styles you know test myself against a striker against a grappler against all different styles especially against guys that are tough because sometimes in the amateur level you see guys that you know they want to pad their record which i get you know you, you want to look good especially when you go into the pros you know you want to get some sponsorship deals but at the end of the day you're going to fight somebody who's tough you know what i'm saying you're going to fight somebody who who hasn't had an easy time coming up, right? And and if first time you're facing them is in the pro levels, that's not a good a good look, you know. I would rather face them in, in my amateurs, knowing that you know I win, lose, draw, whatever happens. Once I go pro, my record resets. Now my I, the experience doesn't, but the record does. So if I take that loss, then I would much rather have done it then than at the pro levels, you know. So it gives me a lot more confidence going into the fights now, knowing that some of these guys, yeah, their records at amateur may be better than I was but a lot of these guys are not you know taking fights that are necessarily pushing them or testing them or you know for them out there to even do anything good it's just pick me fights almost no and that's what I was kind of referencing a little bit towards as well because I like I wholeheartedly agree with you on that I feel there's a lot of guys in this amateur game and not just only in California but in multiple states where they feel that they they want to build themselves before but they also then they hit the pro level and they face another guy that was facing like much like yourself facing a bunch of killers and then they're almost it's a, it's a culture shock almost and they yeah. don't know what to do with it oh 100 percent. i mean there's a book called i think the fighter's heart or the fighter's mind it's one of the two and one of the i read it a long time ago one of the best lessons that you kind of learn in there is that there's people that get stuff from talent and people that get stuff from hard work and the, the lesson from that is just like if you get it from talent or you're getting it from like you know the pick me fights then when you eventually do fall, it's so much harder to build yourself up because you just had an easy time coming up. Whereas the guys that have struggled, you know, every step of the way, you know, they may have had a hard fight here, you know, a hard fight there, and it wasn't the perfect, you know, journey. Those are the dudes that when they do get knocked down, there's nothing to get back up because we've done it before. You know, at the end of the day, I can lose a fight. And yeah, it sucks, you know, but I've lost fights before. I've lost things before. So to lose a fight and get back up is not the worst to me. You know, it's not the most detrimental thing to me for my mental at this point, but I know that there are a lot of guys who haven't tasted that. And so when they eventually do, uh, I hope for them that they have a good, you know, group around them to kind of help them because it sucks when you first taste it, especially doing the sport that we do where, you know, you have hundreds of eyes on you, if not thousands of eyes on you. It, and a lot of them are your friends and fans and family. It's like the feeling of loss is a lot more than if you were on a team sport where you have, you know, six other guys, seven other guys, eight other guys to be able to kind of share in that loss with and share in that kind of sorrow with or share in the blame with even. Oh, no. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. I feel the pressures of MMA are just so it's like, I compare it a lot to track and field, you know, and these athletes competing in the Olympics and they're going in the hundred meters, that pressure is all on them. Although they're working with the coaches in the lead up of all the time, the coaches, they, they are not feeling too much guilt. You know, the coach do it, does whatever they can to get their athletes to that stage. It's more, yeah on the athlete at that point. And I'm, I love, I love that you said the, the fighter of the life. I'm, I'm going to need a recommendation on that book. No, it's, it's a great book. And, and I think that any sport that the, uh, and I don't want to say a, not a team sport, because even like MMA, right. We may go out there and fight by ourselves, but I try to tell the guys all the time. It's, it's not a solo sport because you have a whole team behind you. You have your sparring partners, you have your coach, you have, you know, your, your people that are helping you recover, people helping you with your mental, all those people, you know, your, your boxing coach, your race, whatever it is, that's all team. They may not go out there with you, but that's still your team. So, but I do think that any sport where when you're competing, it is a solo competition, whether it be track and field, gymnastics, you know, uh, combat sports. I think that definitely the, the, the weight on your mental can be a lot more 
it's because it's just you out there you know and sometimes it can feel very lonely because a lot of the times people are there at like you'll see people are there at the highest and not many people are there at the lowest but the more you're at the low the more you start to realize which people are always going to be there and then when you get to the highest it's cool it's great but it's not as much of a uh crazy thing once those people start to kind of fade away because you know which ones will always be there so uh, that's why i say some of these guys i think at the amateur level they just need to start going out there and just fighting and you know testing themselves against guys that are are, are good for themselves against guys that are are better than them you know in certain aspects because eventually you're gonna have to and you don't want to have you don't have to do it when you have hundreds of thousands of eyes on me i'd rather do it when i got you know maybe a thousand eyes on me <laughs> Wise words there from Mr. Lanky MMA. And I, I definitely wholeheart, wholeheartedly agree with that. If I could not, like, if I could put the 100 emoji over that 15 million times, I definitely would. But just to speak a little bit more about this fighting career of yours, recently coming off of your professional debut victory over there against Jesse Lazama at a first yes, round sir. knockout and a, a knockout that blew the roof off the place. I'm that I believe you connected just one, two, and that two landed with some precision like yeah it just it I, can you guide us through what you were seeing in there and i know we talked a little bit about it after but even getting to watch the fight post you know when you're getting to look over some of the tape how did you feel your performance was i mean my performance i think was just just game plan you know we we watch tape you know my coach crispin he's when it comes to the martial arts game, he's a genius and so he knows the amount of tips and tricks that he can give me is, is insane. And, you know, the whole camp leading up that we knew, you know, Jesse's a left-handed guy. So, you know, his, you know, his right hand's going to be forward, which means if I can stay outside of his, his foot, my right hand can go straight down the middle. And if I can double it up, you know, the first one may not land, but the second one will definitely land. And so that was the game plan the whole time. As well as I think I was even telling you, um, when me and Jesse fought as amateurs, I, I don't know what it was. You know, I had this whole vision in my mind that I – was I was going to land a right hand on him and, and that was going to be the fight and it never happened you know we had a, a heavy grappling fight and we were fought as amateurs and it was back and forth and it didn't happen but it was just such a weird thing because of how how much I had felt it and then when they rebooked this fight the feeling came straight back up and so I just kept feeling it kept feeling it and then when we were in the locker room about to walk out I, I told my coach I said it's gonna happen I'm telling you right hand straight down the middle and it's actually funny I even said I said I'm calling it two minutes in the first round and it was like two minutes and 24 seconds. But uh, sometimes you just feel something. So I think that one I just manifested, and it's just was game plan. Game plan, and we practiced it over and over and over again. I feel bad for my boxing coach, Will, because his, his arm is probably exhausted from how much I'm practicing with the right hand. His, his shoulder is a little less, or yeah. less, less aligned, you know? Oh, no, for sure, little... for sure. He's all, he's all a little bit wonky like this. No. <laughs> no, man, and it's it was definitely a hell of a performance. Now you're facing off against Priest Stewart over there, a component you were previously going to face over there when yes, Bellator came into town for California. I believe they were over there at the SAP Center in San Jose, but now looking to possibly take him on over there, Fight Night Tech CU Arena. How are you yes, feeling sir. about the matchup, and how are you feeling about just overall where this could put you in that Fight Night, uh, fight night promotion? Because you're 1-0 there now. 2-0, I mean, what do you feel this win does for you, Chris? Yeah, it puts me 2-0, and and I think that it, 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 in terms of the opportunity for the fight night, you know, and Mr. Coker and, you know, Mr. Melendez, I think that it's a huge opportunity, and I think that, you know, obviously a win would project me great in their eyes. I also think that being against a guy like Dupree is also great, you know, because – you look at Dupree, you know, he was 5-0 and as an amateur, and it's not like he was just taking scrum fights either. You know, it's not like he's a bum himself. So it's, it's like I said, you know, I don't think easy fights because fortune favors the brave, but if you're not fighting the best, you're not going to get the best. So um, I think that definitely fighting him, it's, you know, it's a risk, definitely. You know, it's a good fighter, but I think that the opportunity that it presents is huge. You know, I think that a win over him could definitely give me a good opportunity to if they – Decide at any point in time that they want to make, you know, that, that 170, you know, welterweight championship belt for five night at the Tech. You know, I definitely think if I went over Dupree, could put my name in that conversation because, man, I ain't in the sport just for just for cashing checks. I want some gold around my waist, you know. So if, if they're going to make a belt, you know, I want to be in that conversation. So I think a, a win over Dupree, especially a good decisive win, I think could, could definitely uh, put my name in that conversation when, they, when, when and if they finally do decide to do that. 
No, and like how you said, Dupree Stewart, definitely one of the most impressive prospects. And that 1-0 was very deceiving because like how you said, 5-0 in his amateur career. But he was taking on a lot of guys that have gone on to go to a professional career. And then getting a win, start off his pro career. Now 1-0 for both you gentlemen heading into this matchup prior to what would have been a debuting professional matchup over there at Bellator. So I feel it, it only adds to the skill level of both you gentlemen. But speaking a little bit more about you personally, my man, because – let me just say, fans, if you do not know, Dimitri has some of the best music taste out of any of the fighters that follow me right now. F- top five P2 songs, I need them. Let me know. What are they? Uh, my top five Chief Keith songs. I honestly can't do top, top five Chief Keith. I grew up in Chicago, so that's like asking me to choose like any of his. You know what I mean? Like when he, yeah. I remember when he, when, he, when he first started coming out, I was probably like a freshman maybe a sophomore in in high school. And it was like, I was so juiced. I was like, hell yeah, it's Chicago drill rap blowing up. Especially Chief Keith, because when growing up in Chicago, like you heard, we had heard some of his music, some of his underground stuff, like, um, oh, I'm blanking on the names now, but just some stuff like it's, all, it's really earlier stuff before even like Love Sosa, before any of that stuff. And so when he blew up, that was huge. I honestly can't name um, my top five because that's like, yeah, I can't. But I will tell you this. Fineco it's like asking to pick your favorite dog name. or your favorite Number child. One. Exactly. A hundred percent. Which is my favorite family member. I just can't. But Fernando is my number one. Like, that's like my one that will always get me hyped up and, and will get me, like, ready to just fight somebody or get me to ready to just party, whatever it is. But, yeah, man, how did you get into Chief Keith? Because, I mean, how old are you, man? You're like, what? Funny enough. So, the Chief Keith origin story is on me. I was in seventh grade. And I was looking through Apple Music in the top chart, and I seen Love Sosa. And I was like, oh, what's, what's the song? Listen to it. And then I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and I like, I'm one of those guys where if I like one of your songs, I'll listen to multiple of them, try and get a feel for you. And after that, I was just like, you know, Chief Keep, like something about his music and the way it was running, man. But I, I'd say for my favorite, I got to go Glow Gang Mafia. It's always a, it's a pretty like hard hitting song in the car, always a banger. If not, Glow Gang Mafia, a little bit of the newer catalog, see through off of, uh, I forgot, I think it's Ford War, that album. Yeah. One of my favorites. So definitely love Chief Keep, huge fan of his music as well. So, you know, and then he's over there in Los Angeles now. Man, is there ever a chance you're going to see him, uh, him walking you out to one of your fights? Man, I don't know how he's out in, Los- in LA, man. Personally speaking, if my net worth was over a million, you wouldn't see me step foot in LA, man. That's how dangerous that city is. Like, I love LA. I all love Crazy. LA. It's just like with the amount of murders and robberies happening, you know, look at them, all the people that are all the artists that have died there in the past like five, six years. I'm like, as an artist, I don't know. How, all props to them because I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd be having to have a house in the hills where no one would see me, no one would be able to come in. So, all the power to them. But yeah, man, that'd be cool getting walked me out to a fight. You know, maybe, maybe I got to talk to Dana. <laughs> uh, give me, give me, the, give me the extended series so I can get a contract so I can get you keep me up to one of your pay-per-views, man. That's that's the goal. That would be PTGs, sick, that would... baby. <laughs> and speaking a little bit about that UFC level, actually perfectly translated into my next question. Driscus Duplessis, obviously a huge talent that came from the likes of South Africa, and then you have Cameron Simon. There's a UFC South African presence has definitely arisen. How do you yeah. feel about the? development of south african mma and not only south african mma the stars that are going into it i mean like how we said just just and just in general yeah. the whole country of africa just overall has just shown leaps and bounds in mma growth over these years i mean i love it man it's being south african is one of my most proud accolades that i have about myself like i hold it to to, to such a high esteem because it, it's such a beautiful country and the people are so beautiful and, the, you know, the culture is so beautiful. And it's just terrible that, you know, the history and just corruption and so many different aspects have, have brought Africa as a whole to where it is. You know what I mean? Because there's so many different beautiful parts of it. So being able to see South Africa and even other African countries that are starting to kind of make this rise in, in MMA is, is beautiful. Because as a South African, I know that mentally South Africans and, and anybody from the continent of Africa is one of the toughest SOBs you will ever meet. It's just, there's just no quitting us. You know what I mean? South Africa is a country of, I don't know how many people with a par with a unemployment of like 40, 50%, but it doesn't stop us. You know, the, the poverty is, I don't know how high, 
it doesn't stop us. We just keep going. We just we just keep trying. You know, the spring box, you know, they they they've shown us that no matter how bad things get, you know, if you just keep trying, things can get better and the whole country will be behind you. So being able to see guys like Drake, being able to see guys like Cameron, being guys like all of the guys in EFC that are fighting out there in, in the big promotion, it, it's beautiful, man. I'm loving it because it's just going to be, it's going to keep growing, keep growing. And seeing it grow there just opens the door for even other countries where, you know, you, you don't have a lot of fighters coming out of because MMA doesn't maybe even seem attainable to them. But that's the beautiful thing about MMA, right? The same thing about boxing is, you don't have to be the most athletic. You don't have to be, you know, the richest. If you got a fighting spirit and you can throw a punch, you got a chance to be the best in the world, you know. And I think that that's the beautiful thing about fighting and, and seeing places like South Africa kind of coming up in it is is amazing. Absolutely amazing. I, I truly do appreciate your time today, Dimitri. It's been an awesome opportunity to get to speak to you and get to hear more about your MMA career, but also get to hear about a little bit of the personal life, getting to hear about your the love for Chief Keith, you know, getting to hear these little tidbits and tricks about the life of Mr. Lanky MMA. Anybody you yes, want to hear in particular before this matchup over there on December 14th at the Texas Arena in San Jose, California against Mr. Dupree Stewart? I mean, I just want to thank, you know, obviously Mr. Coker, Mr. Melendez, you know, JT, all the guys at Financial Tech for giving me this opportunity. Just the first opportunity as well as this one, you know, bringing me back. I, I can't thank them enough for this opportunity. I want to, you know, thank my coaches, all my training partners, my, my parents, you know, for all the support that they give me. Because at the end of the day, it's, like I said, man, it's ain't, it's ain't a solo sport. Those are the people that make this possible and everybody that tunes in to watch us, everybody that tunes in to, to watch me fight, you guys make this possible because I could be the best fighter in the world, but Nobody wants to watch me fight. I ain't going to be fighting. So, yeah, I got to thank everybody else, man. But I appreciate you for all your time, man. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I enjoy talking to you, man. It's, a ple- it's a, always a pleasure to get to have fighters of your caliber on my program, man. And, and great, even, and even, even greater pleasure when they get to want to come on, man. Dimitri hit me up wanting to be on the program. It's always a great pleasure when I get guys <laughs> wanting to hit me up and be on the program. And truly an honor to get to speak to you before this upcoming bout over there in December, my man. Best of skill to you when it comes that time over there. December 14th at the Tech CU Arena, Mr. Dupree Stewart, Dimitri Gorditas. Make sure you guys get your tickets when they are on sale right now. I believe they got a sale going right now on those tickets. So make sure you guys yes, go ahead and cop those from either Dimitri or for uh, – how is that working? Are they buying the tickets directly, doing the ticket link? How are they doing the ticket sales for this event? Yeah, so if you just go online to my Instagram, to Linky MMA, there's a link in my bio. You can just get the tickets right through there. That's the easiest way because we don't have any physical tickets, so it's, it's all online. So the link through for the tickets is in my bio or the or the uh, um, the venue's bio as well, I believe. You heard it here first, folks. Michael Hernandez here, MLH Media, over here in the central coast of California, going to be signing out to Mitchell Gorgidas over there in the Bay Area. Thank you so much for your time today, brother.